Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks a lot for joining this talk. It's one of the last talks, so I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, so first of all, I'd like to help you out with pronouncing my surname, which is like really long and terrible and a challenge to pronounce, and maybe 1% of people do it right from the very beginning. So it's Bazilevskaya, and you can forget it immediately. <laughs> um, so um, first of all, um, I have a question to you. So um, from all the conversations through a um, couple of days before my talk, I realized that most of the uh, attendees of the workshop are publishers, but um, some of you potentially are brands who are potentially creating content for, uh, to market their brand. So are there any non-publishers in here? Um, okay, okay, cool. Uh, so when I was designing this talk, I, um, I was thinking um, both about branded content and uh, editorial content um, because I think that um, 2018 is sort of a tipping point for uh, branded content to become much larger operation in general. Um, Neiman Slab projection for um, journalism for 2018 is that retailers will uh, move into content. So I think that brands who are like B2B brands are already doing a lot of branded content uh, and B2C brands are increasing their budgets. But I think that um, all of them are moving from one-offs to running tailored, owned, uh, high quality branded media. Uh, and blogs are still on and still rated high as um, a format that helps to drive um, sales and brand awareness. So obviously there are other formats as well, but blogs are still important. So first of all, I want to take a step back and actually tell you a little bit more about how I got into this whole visual storytelling thing. Um, from the very beginning my, of my career from the university, I was really excited about communication and um, in general, um, it's power to change human behavior and actually deliver uh, complex information and something that needs to be you know, processed and understood. And not surprisingly, I ended up working in advertising first. And my first executive job back in 2005 was with um, a research unit within Publicis Group Media. With, um, we worked for agencies like Starcom, MediaVest, Liebernet, for brands like P&G, Coke, Levi's, and other uh, clients. And my job was to research um, how media budgets are spent, how creative performs. And um, one of the um, particularly exciting studies that we did was um, dedicated to so-called excellence in craft. Um, Liebernet Network has this um, seven plus ad rating system that is called um, seven plus because it has these 10 parameters above seven um, that um, indicate the level of creative work and after seven it becomes sort of outstanding. And the seventh principle is excellence in craft which means production value. Uh, it could be videography, it could be design, it could be music, anything that is connected with production. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to understand if uh, excellence in craft uh, transits into uh, ad recall, ad impact, ad attitudes to advertising, purchase intent, or other parameters. And what was interesting to me is that we did see this immediate link. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, it didn't really, um, it did not only go with um, premium products or certain product categories. It was true for um, different customer groups. Um, and it was pretty exciting to learn that. And um, this was the moment when I first realized that design uh, really can impact um, the uh, actual indicators. Um, then I actually did potentially a very stupid thing. I decided to leave my well-paid job and uh, become a startup co-founder. Uh, and this startup was a, a publishing company that was back in the days just a website that was had this ambition to become a um, large um, cultural publication in the region. And so I did. I was brought initially to drive revenues, but got really involved in product strategy as well because it was a startup and everybody got involved in, into everything. Uh, and um, so what we did, we actually launched two uh, major titles and they grew into becoming uh, largest 
digital publications in the region in premium um, with 7 million units per month. That might, might not sound much to you with your scale, but in the region, we competed successfully against Candenas brands, Hearst brands, Time Out, and a bunch of local players. Uh, and after launching licenses, we've um, expanded to four countries and 13 cities. We've also became a um, large and pretty successful branded content producer. So we were doing unique branded content for more than 900 brands and uh, won uh, over 65 ad awards for that, including Conlines, DNAD, One Show, and so on and so forth, uh, and learned a lot from both branded content and editorial content. Because we were not a license and we just built out CMS from scratch and we had no guidelines and we could do whatever we wanted to do, uh, we were experimenting massively with formats, with how we design content. And um, first of all, we just designed it better because we thought it a right thing to do if you're a premium publisher. But then we started actually measuring uh, whether design uh, is impacting content performance. And uh, what we learned is that it does. Uh, it directly connected to um, scroll depth and uh, time on the pages when we were comparing off an article that was, um, you know, had less design uh, involved and more de and articles that uh, were better designed. So we also did an interesting uh, study where we um, we uh, exposed a sample of users to more premium and better designed content for a certain period of time and then tracked whether it impacted their uh, clickability in social um, because they expected better experience. And um, we learned that it does. And I think it's really similar to a couple of studies I saw when people were connecting display and context advertising into one like flow and actually seeing that um, people who saw display ads clicked more because they had more trust or more brand awareness. So I think that it's a very similar pattern where people just learn more about the brand or n expect a better experience. So it might impact their um, clicks in other channels as well. Um, so yeah, so another task we did is that we um, were trying to understand what is the impact of content design versus editorial quality design. And I would not definitely say that because I think editorial quality is very, very important. But with um, some of the stories, we actually saw that people um, were scoring design uh, a, like a very important factor and then it outperformed the overall score and outperformed the editorial quality into this, in this test. Um, with branded content, we also saw the same thing. We um, did different campaigns. This one done for AquaView with um, eight minutes of reading time with 2% conversion rates into eye checks. So it really worked the same way across editorial and branded content. Obviously, with branded content, it's, it's much more of a challenge because people, you know, like they uh, want to engage with editorial content much more. So that's how we realized that um, better visual experience with content um, is enhancing performance. It needs to be optimized. And I think that um, that's how it started. Um, but uh, being within a product department of a publishing company, we couldn't really scale this game. We could not uh, do more. Uh, and that's why we decided to spin off and launch Setka as a completely separate company. And um, this is us on our first WordCamp US. Um, so yeah, so that's how it started. And the talk now. Uh, I would like to talk about three steps that uh, I need, need to be done to uh, optimize uh, visual experience with the content. And um, those steps are first, optimization of um, your approach to visual expression. Uh, second, it optimizing your uh, brand identity because it's also a part of visual experience with content. And then the third step is basically doing it across all the platforms where the content could be consumed. So um, optimizing the visual expression itself. Here, I would like to divide it into like three parts. First, I would again want to talk about the why. Uh, why should we do that? I shared previously with you 
uh, how, how I learned it through my personal experience, but then there is some research data that proves that too, and also could create a framework to measure this performance and uh, set a goal for uh, optimizing it further. Um, then what and how, um, in this part, I would like to highlight which content actually needs to be designed better, because obviously not all the content is worth you know, special investment into design. Uh, it could be like the quantity of words could be an indicator than uh, other factors could be as well. And then in here as well, I would share some tips on what could be actually done. And obviously all these tips are very, very should be tailored to topic, to, to goals of each publisher or each brand, but some of the things are, um, could work for, for everybody. And then where, um, where is, where in the process, in content production process, uh, we should make a change to actually apply this um, learnings. So why, again, um, there were multiple studies done to uh, measure uh, how aesthetics perform, how content perform uh, in terms of emotional appeal. And um, those studies were done with um, EMG sensors that measure our emotional, um, subconscious emotional reactions, because uh, when we start frowning, um, the, the, these muscles on our face, they're directly connected with uh, emotional centers in the brain. So subconsciously, we start frowning when we see something that is you know, uninteresting and give us, or give us, uh, giving us some negative emotions, then eye trackers as well. And um, interesting enough, um, there were um, interesting findings about uh, how people, um, how design, layouts design, typography, uh, content structure impacts our emotion and our engagement. Um, specifically interesting term here is relative subjective duration. Uh, when we are enjoying an activity, we barely notice how time flies. And uh, that um, it was found that we tend to underestimate time when we enjoy doing something. And that is a great indicator of engagement with uh, any activity or content, let's say. And in tests, people were underestimating their reading time by three to five minutes when exposed to better design content, which was around 20 to 30 percent of overall reading time. And interesting enough, their underestimation was in one test seven, and then two times in, in other tests two times higher than uh, for like the, the other article, which is a massive difference. Apart from engagement, um, there was emotional connection. And um, the emotional, positive emotions uh, were uh, connected directly to better design content as well. And um, high content preferences as well, because people were uh, preferring openly uh, in questionnaires um, better design content. Uh, and here I'd like to um, talk about emotional reactions in general. Um, in neuroscience and in psychology, again, there are multiple studies that show that emotions are not a byproduct of our cognition, but actually a gatekeeper to our decision making. So it starts with emotional involvement and then we analyze information and make a decision. So that is why it's obvious why emotional involvement is directly connected with uh, higher preference. If uh, you ask consumers themselves, they also state that they would prefer better layout, they would uh, prefer content that is more engaging or has a power to hold their attention. Um, or if we talk branded content, uh, if I'm going to follow a company's content, I would prefer to see more polished, curated content. So why content design matters? It matters because it will lead to high preference, higher time on the page, and uh, higher scroll depth as well. So we, as a tool, we do not gather any data uh, with our clients. So the only data we, are, uh, we can analyze is the one that we get from um, design experiments or uh, with um, campaigns, like branded content campaigns. So this one done with um, 
Middle Eastern uh, Native Ad Network in Gaja and with uh, a brand called Karher. And this is the example of this terrible native article that usually uh, a place with native ad networks, which is very short, completely product focused, doesn't have any um, editorial value, but then when design was applied to that, it was more engaging in terms of time span, in terms of depth and everything, uh, which is, I think, a good indicator because when content is even better, it gives you much more space to, um, to um, rise the performance. So what and how, which articles needs to be, need to be designed, meaning which articles would be, um, which articles would really rise in their performance if being designed. Um, so the question is whether, um, whether it is even a challenge to, uh, to design better content, uh, and are we designing it well enough today? Um, I think that, yes, uh, it is a challenge because currently we are using just you know a couple of elements, maybe a couple of quotes, couple of customized callouts, couple of images, and that's it. And um, the best design um, that that really performs needs to be much more tailored to each story, and each story is very different. Um, I like to think of a designer um, who. Um, who is not just creating a container for content, but actually making an argument, making um, add, adding on to to the to the story meaning and to its persuasive power. Um, I think that um, print uh, sometimes, not sometimes in many, many uh, ways does much better job sometimes creating immersive content experience, and this could be uh, definitely transited to um, digital content as well. Um, so which articles uh, are worth designing uh, better? Uh, for brands, I think it's all the articles because every article is uh, a branded content, it's creating branded experience, and um, it needs to be uh, designed better. Then for publishers, uh, especially if you monetize for advertising, it might not make financial sense to actually design, invest into design every article. But then articles that are in 800 to 1,000 words range definitely worth, uh, are worth being designed because they just perform better uh, because it's impossible to read them and uh, complex stories as well, when you have a very complex com concept or um, mm, difficult topic, uh, it makes sense to uh, design it better. And coming back to the experiments ran um, in different science research, um, some of the studies shown that actually better design um, helped people to uh, solve different creative and um, cognitive tasks better when exposed to better design, uh, meaning that probably it, it helps to understand things better. Um, then, obviously, publishers work with branded content, and also we found out that lists or listings of products or different other um, you know, places, maybe locations, they also perform better when better designed, because with lists, uh, the initial content could be very different, the, the images could be different, different, um, the, the they could be all different colors and shapes, and when you structure them better, uh, it helps. So we did a little um, study of um, RSS feeds of uh, WordPress VIP clients who are um, producing content. And this is um, like a breakdown of um, recency of posts and the size of posts in uh, words. So. Um, it's average, and obviously it's hard to judge, um, but it's obvious that long-form content has a uh, certain significant percentage, maybe not super high, but it is out there, and it's still um, being produced and still being read, uh, and a lot of publishers are doing it. So this is an example of a uh, um, story we did with um, uh, Microsoft. And um, using this example, I'd like to um, talk about 
um, the, um, the actual elements of the article and uh, the um, sort of eye magnets or different, like there could be illustrations, callouts, uh, or other uh, elements, those are animated. Um, and we learned um, optimizing different articles, editorial and branded, that um, the optimal range is around um, from 200 to 300 words when you really need to put something to actually re-engage the user to get um, uh, the reader to scroll down. The fold, obviously, it's um, a very important um, moment where uh, the immersive uh, layouts work really well uh, when you get it right from the beginning. It helps to scroll down or something else uh, before the fold. Then um, immersive layouts in general and this um, print-like um, layouts where it's not all squares, um, they also create this um, feeling of um, um, that uh, you want to you know, scroll, scroll uh, deeper and read it through. Uh, obviously, you need to mind CTAs if you have any email subscription or CTAs or any, if you are driving some um, form, forms or other um, action-based items, you need to place them wisely throughout the article. And um, overall performance is very important as well. Um, the lists. So this one was done with uh, L'Oreal. And in here you see just, you know, like a list of different recommendations and product reviews that um, coming back to the lists and other formats, you might be doing other formats that could really benefit from uh, better design while having not so many words within them. So it's not only about words, it's about formats and how they could perform better. Um, this is an example of um, a print article adaptation in the web um, done by a London-based system magazine, and they were licensing off the content to other countries, and this was done in Singapore. So they were just transiting a print article into uh, um, an interactive um, web article um, on, across several publications. So now where? Um, what we were trying to understand throughout our product research is how actually designers design. Because um, when you have preset elements and you just put text and then elements and then the text, it's um, not really how design and experience worked. We were screening um, editorial designers who were in the process and also interviewing them right after trying to understand how they, um, how they work. Is it, um, do they have the initial layout idea and then they implement it? Do they actually change all the things around as they go? And um, um, what we learned is that actually it's a lot like editing experience, like text editing experience when you really change things around, move them around, uh, put um, you know, different blocks in different places, and it's really important to um, facilitate this process. Um, remember in the snowfall uh, here, um, I think that this story uh, is amazing, and I heard um, the team speaking at a conference about how it was done, and um, this particular story took a huge team uh, to do, obviously not because of the editorial design, mostly because of the concept and the vid video part of it. Uh, but in any case, I think that the big question uh, every publisher has, um, how to make this um, beautiful editorial design efficient, how to make it scalable, because uh, in any case, we see only one-offs. Like It's not that often when publishers produce beautiful uh, editorials um, today. So our approach here was that, um, and I think that it could be applied in multiple ways, that it could be like a flexible conveyor. So you, um, you have a process that has um, certain scalable um, uh, elements, and then you have uh, flexible parts to it that uh, are in hands of a designer. 
uh, not only in the hands of the development team. Because when we customize the CMS, the editor of the CMS, we um, presume certain things. And then um, when designer has an ability to change more around the layout, it gives um, much more flexibility to tailor story to, uh, to tailor design to the story. So the second step is um, how to optimize your approach to brand identification. Uh, and um, today, obviously, a post is a landing page. Uh, and people get into uh, an article from multiple channels. It could be social media search uh, and referring sites. And um, at the moment where people land on the page, they get um, an experience with content, and uh, it is a branded experience. So they um, see some recognizable elements to identify the brand. And um, I think that this uh, has two major um, uh, impacts. First one is short term, because uh, branding generates trust. And um, let's say Facebook. At F8, they were uh, talking about their recent case with Mashable, where they added more. I'm sorry for the images quality. I was just uh, picturing from my phone. So uh, they added um, capabilities in the instant articles for um, custom fonts, for different other design elements to help publishers um, add more of a brand identity into the content, because based on their data, visual elements of branding actually generate trust uh, and helps uh, with user engagement um, on based on trust. And then there is a long-term uh, impact of uh, branding um, that I think is connected with uh, memory. Because memory, coming back to emotional impact, uh, emotions and memory are very closely connected. We remember. Um, things that had uh, emotional impact much more than um, you know things that didn't involve us much, uh, and this um, was massively studied in psychology, in neuroscience, in advertising as well. When um, emotional uh, reaction was closely tied to ad recall, um, so to ad memorability, and so with content branding again, uh, I think that we usually have um, not a lot of branding elements. Maybe quotes, maybe, maybe a couple of other um, elements, but then it doesn't really help to create a very flexible branded experience. Uh, and this is uh, an example we did with um, eBay, uh, with their publication. Uh, and um, this is just a part of the different elements that were created uh, and tailored to actual needs. But uh, just imagine that you can play with this system and, uh, it, and, and, and it evolves through time and um, becomes you know, different. Um, this one uh, is, uh, was done for, with uh, Bushwick Daily, which is a hyper-local publication in Brooklyn. Uh, again, um, all the different elements. And the idea behind it is that you don't customize once, you then give designer uh, a power to actually add on top of that maybe new cards, new uh, little formats that all create, create branded experience, but a, in a very flexible and tailored way. Um, so yeah, I think that branding system could be much more flexible and uh, could evolve much more often. Um, the third step is uh, optimizing across uh, all platforms. And the question I have to you uh, would be um, how much, like what percentage of content um, do you send to the platforms? Because some of the publishers have monetization challenges, let's say with instant articles. Do you, uh, do you work with Snapchat Discover, for instance? Who works with Snapchat Discover? Okay, and um, in terms of percentage of content that um, is being sent to um, Facebook instant articles, would it be all of it or, so all of it for, no? Percentage of it? Okay, for sure. <laughs> 
So what was interesting at um, WordCamp for Publishers in Denver um, that um, there was this whole argument about uh, whether, um, like what percentage of content could be sent and how it gets transformed and how it performs. Um, and um, the interesting um, thing, I think, is that um, if you compare different platforms, and this is just a comparison of all the features like around typography, around multimedia, and so on and so forth, not getting into the details, uh, it's obvious that both AMP and Apple News give you a lot of flexibility. You can do a lot of things with uh, um, customized typography, with layouts, with uh, different elements, and so on, but not a lot of publishers are actually using all this potential on a daily basis. And uh, like it's like lease, blocks, charts, um, uh, a lot of things. So again, um, F8 um, shown that Facebook is moving from being so restricted to more flexibility is also uh, an indicator uh, because the argument that was, um, uh, that was uh, happening at, at Denver was that whether we should simplify completely to uh, push it to the platforms or should we um, actually create great content and, uh, and care about design more across all the channels. And I think it it's like in Gauss law when you uh, when a system evol uh, when a system appears it usually appears in a very simple way and then it evolves to become more complex and I think that that's what happens with uh, with uh, multiple platforms because they um, become more and more sophisticated to support better design so this is for example an article um, by the Washington Post uh, featured at Apple News and then um, here is this article uh, within Apple News, and here is this, this article, the same article on um, the, the website. And they are different, and I can't really say, but I can presume that potentially they were done specifically, this article was specifically done for Apple News experience. Um, but, and it's much more immersive um, than um, this experience, while it actually could be um, similarly done uh, and similarly immersive. So um, what we've been working on is um, the way how we can actually take this beautiful interactive content and transform it uh, to multiple platforms, keeping the design level um, at the same, uh, the same design level. Uh, our, so what we do, we just, when we create uh, an article in the editor, we store all the elements separately. So it's like a sort of like a tree-like structure where then we can actually take them and repackage to every format uh, according to all the protocols. And um, this enables this um, seamless transition um, that um, hopefully will help um, both publishers and brands actually keep the, the editorial design uh, quality across the platforms and use the entire potential that um, AMP and Apple News are giving to the publishers. Facebook is a little bit um, less um, flexible, but potentially could get to more um, complexity soon. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, we, like if you take a look of what actually could be done, we can take, uh, again, look at the charts. Um, just everything. So you can actually, you know, customize the, the typography in any way. You can do uh, layouts in multiple ways. So a lot could be done. Not everything, but so much. And if you look at what's being done, sometimes it's not what, like, it, 
it's not even near to what could be done on this platform, you know? Um, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think also it's like, it's also like, um, important thing to understand, like, the problem that can be solved, you know, rather than can kind of, uh, a library where the name has to, like, where it's more about solving problems together. So the short answer for me is yes, you know, there should be more people using this as a community adoption and working towards the common goal together. Ideally, you Um, so um, usually, um, like it depends whether it's um, like that. If we take the artwork preparation out, I mean, like the illustration. So it's um, you know hour, hour, and maybe hour and a half. Um, with with native ad networks, it, the speed matters because usually the text comes in before, like the day before it should be placed. So uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, and when we were comparing it off, like customized design or uh, when you do like coding around that or short coding, um, it takes um, much more hours to make it and you have to work with a designer and developer at the same time. And here it could be a designer or even an editor who has um, some, you know, like who, who is able to work with uh, visuals. And uh, if you, had a, you have a setup with this uh, different elements that you can play with, then it could be an editor just doing it. Yeah. 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 So we've uh, we are uh, Gutenberg competitor uh, com, com, uh, compatible. We um, so we are a block that could be added to Gutenberg, um, and um, I think that um, Gutenberg uh, is being a, a platform that helps you customize on much broader level. But then when you get to actual article layout, um, you might uh, want to add a little bit more customization that could be done by a designer or uh, an editor without coding background. And then I think it's a perfect combination when you can customize for Gutenberg like uh, around other blocks uh, and uh, other ed like dynamic elements that are connected to the database and also uh, additional visual elements. And then you can work with the layout uh, with a dis like designer could do that. Is Satan stories in the roadmap? Uh, we are building now, so like we are very close to launching um, the actual broader the the tool because we've been doing uh, custom projects. So the the uh, the data structure I showed you uh, was applied to tailored projects where we, we were uh, converting to like JSON and native apps and also to uh, other formats. But now we are scaling to become an actual tool for all of the customers. Uh, so, um, and including like AMP and. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time.